So I'd like to tell you about some of the experiences that we've had in handling and analyzing data from a genome-wide association study. And in particular, what I'd, like to get, what I'd like to leave you with a sense of is things that you need to think of um, before you get your data in order to be able to uh, deal with it. So the, the things I'm going to go through today are um, storing large amounts of genotype data, um, issues of quality control, which we've already started to cover, um, generating the initial association results and viewing those results, imputation of the missing SNP genotypes, and then storing results and planning specialized analysis. So the, the kind of takeaway message from this, uh, if you haven't already figured it out, is that genotype data is huge. So if you have 500,000 SNPs and 2,000 cases and controls, you're going to end up with a billion genotypes. Um, this means you're going to need compact ways to store the data. Um, one efficient way to store that data, if you, if you code your genotypes as 0001 or 11, you'll have a file that looks like um, rows of zeros and ones with the person indicated in yet orange, and then you'll have a SNP indicated as the row here. The total file space for 300K SNPs is about 4 gigabytes, and the largest chromosome file out of this would be about 0.4 gigabytes. Now, this has strong, strong ramifications for, I think, how people are used to doing things unless you're used to dealing with very, very large data sets. So one of the first things is these chromosome data sets, even when stored um, efficiently, they're too large for SAS or other commonly used analytical packages to handle. So you're going to need programs to select genotypes out of these files and to write them out into the multiple formats of programs that you're going to use to analyze them. And it also means that testing of procedures with large-scale trial data sets uh, will be very useful before you get your actual genotype data. So there are other sorts of data that, that would be useful to collect. Um, one is the pretty, uh, pretty simple stuff of chromosome and position. We've also found it very useful to have files that, that contain um, genes and functional annotation for different SNPs. And another issue that comes up in trying to combine data across studies and also keep things straight within your own study is how you're going to call the alleles, because there are two different strands. And so one strategy um, that we and others have taken is to calling your alleles um, based on the forward strand, for instance, of a given genome build. That gives somebody outside of your study a quick reference and a way to be able to compare their data to yours. So one of the first questions that you're going to want to ask is how good is the data. So you're going to want to identify and remove bad samples and SNPs. And then for both you and someone who's reading about your data, you're going to want to compute summary statistics, including um, percent successfully genotype samples, average genotyping success rate, duplicate sample error rate, and this non-Mendelian inheritance error rate, which are essentially errors that are not consistent with normal transmission of chromosomes in family members. So how do you identify the bad samples? Um, as Elizabeth has, has um, started to show examples of, so you can look at bad samples and, and find them by the genotyping success rate. Typically, um, bad samples are defined as genotyping success rates less than either 95 to 97.5 percent. You can look for a greater than expected proportion of heterozygous genotypes. And I don't think Elizabeth showed an example of where you actually had two samples mixed together in sample contamination, and if that happens, you'll get more heterozygous genotypes than you expect. Um, you'll want to remove related individuals, and this happens more often than you might expect, uh, that, that in your control groups or in your case groups, you end up with people who are brothers or sisters or even people who um, decide to participate twice and have forgetten that, forgotten they've done that. Um, so if you think they're independent, you're going to want to remove them, and that can be done um, based on looking at pairwise comparisons of similarity of the genotypes. There will often be sample switches um, that can be uh, caught by seeing that somebody has switched sexes during your um, experiment. And um, if you're working with cell lines, cell lines, in order to survive when they're being transformed, often lose or gain chromosomes. So you will want to check your data to see if there are any large regions 
um, of homozygosity, particularly those that are not compatible with life um, as a human, because uh, it, happens, it happens fairly often. So identifying poor quality SNPs, one way to do this um, is to look, as Elizabeth explained, is that to look at the expected proportions of genotypes that are not consistent with the observed allele frequencies. Um, this is called Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Uh, people use different thresholds to call SNPs bad. I've seen um, for genome-wide data thresholds from 10 to the minus 4th to 10 to the minus 6th. Uh, you can also do something that I think is good to do with all of your quality control measures, which is to look at uh, a deviation from the expected distribution um, of p-values under the null um, and just see where your, your distribution starts to deviate. Uh, genotyping success rate for SNPs, usually less than 95 percent, is considered the cutoff. Um, you can look at the duplicated sample or non-Mendelian error rate um, and see if that's elevated for your samples. Again, it's a good thing to calculate the overall um, sample error rate and then ask, is the rate I observe, you know, for each SNP consistent uh, with that rate? And as Elizabeth brought up, looking um, for differences in cases and controls, especially differential missingness between these two groups, um, is very important, especially if you've had samples that were collected in different ways or genotyped at different times, um, because th there certainly are cases in which you can see lovely associations um, that turn out to be differences in missingness in these two groups. So there are um, programs available for large-scale quality control analysis. It's, it's possible and perhaps likely that when you get your genotyping data back from um, the genotyping service, they will have calculated these. You may want to select out specific sets of samples you're using for, um, for publication. You may want to run these on your own. So two that I know about, and I'm sure that there are, are more of these. One is a program called Plink, which I'll mention um, actually multiple times in the, the presentation. And another one is a program called GainQC. Gain Plink was developed by Sean Purcell and GainQC by um, Gonzalo Abacasis. Both of these have comprehensive suites of tests for quality control, um, and they've both been optimized to deal with large amounts of samples and large amounts of SNPs. So once you get to this point, doing your initial association analysis is, is, is pretty straightforward. Um, for case control analysis, you want to use a test that's not affected by deviations from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Um, the Cochrane Armitage test for trend is a, is a popular one that's actually equivalent to the score test um, in logistic regression. Um, if you have family-based samples, uh, you'll be using a TDT or other family-based test. Um, and for quantitative traits, a uh, uh, straightforward quantitative trait um, association analysis. Again, there are programs available to do these kind of basic analysis on a large scale. Um, Plink has case control, some family-based tests, and quantitative traits. Um, Merlin has the capacity to do quantitative traits in independent samples and in families, and it actually has the ability to impute genotypes for untyped individuals based on genotyped family members. So if you have large families you want to analyze, you may want to think about whether you need to, anal whether you need to genotype all family members. Okay, so the, the next question that you want to ask is, are the results of your study believable? And as David shown, some of the ways to do that are to look at a QQ plot where you look at the expected distribution of p-values relative to the observed. Um, some, of the, some of the other questions that you might ask are, are there stronger associations correlated with poor quality, um, poor SNP um, quality control measures? Um, is there confounding uh, from differences in um, genetic origins of the case and control samples or population stratification. And these can be dealt with in a couple of different ways um, using genomic control or an eigenstrat analysis. If you have SNPs um, that are, if you, if you have cases and controls that come from uh, populations that are very different, it's still not clear to me that you can completely correct for uh, differences with 
with these analysis, but I think it's probably going to be relatively few SNPs that would, that would sneak through. So seeing um, is, is a good thing uh, for helping you understand your data once you get it. And there are multiple different ways to, to go about graphing the data. So the, the program um, Plink has different graphical outputs. You can actually add custom tracks onto the UCSC browser. So for folks who aren't familiar with that, this is a, a great resource that you can go to to look at different biological features of the genome. It shows you the genes. Um, it can show you LD. Um, and then you have homemade graphs. And my feeling is that there's no one particular graph or, or program that's going to meet what you want to do to analyze your data. So to give you a sense, this is a place where we've taken, and the bottom tracks, all except for the, the top one with the purple lines, are the typical uh, tracks available on UCSC. And what we've done is we've taken and uploaded the fusion data onto this browser. So the height of the purple line is the strength of the association in our region of interest. So we're able to overlay our association results with any of the genomic annotation that we'd like on the genome browser. And there are a couple different ways, um, a couple different ways of doing this. The other thing is that many different people have many different ways that they um, display similar data. So these are three pictures um, from three papers of the type 2 diabetes uh, genomic analysis. And what each one is showing you is in different panels the, the strength of association. I don't know if I have a pointer here. So the strength of association in the top panels across a region with some annotation of, of different SNPs. And then in these two, a picture of the linkage disequilibrium underneath the, the top panel. And what this gives you is a sense of how strongly, um, how much repetition there is basically in the, the, um, the, the haplotypes and in the, the SNPs that are in each different region. So you can see here in this graph, there, this is the association scale um, in a negative log 10 p-value from 0 to 5. You can see that there is a large set of SNPs, right, that show association. But if you look down on the graph below to the R squared, which essentially tells you how correlated these different SNPs are, you'll see this is a region of very high, very high correlation between these SNPs. And so that, in fact, if you correct for any one of these SNPs, all of the other associations go away. So this sense of knowing what the linkage disequilibrium looks like underneath a SNP um, is, is very useful in trying to decipher what sorts of information you have from your data. So, so one of the questions that, that is, is, has already been brought up is essentially getting more for your genotype dollars or imputation um, of SNP genotypes. So this, this imputation, um, there are two reasons why you might want to do this. So one is even for your, your markers that pass your quality control, um, you may have, you will have some missing data sometimes within the genotyped markers. A lot of them are, are genotyped completely. Um, and so it would be nice to have complete data for each marker. And then probably of even greater interest is having information on untyped markers. And so there, there are a couple of programs out there uh, that, that, that allow you to, to impute or infer these genotypes. And the approach that they take is to use the haplotype structure of an existing sample, such as the HapMap, to infer data for samples with sparser marker sets. So to give you a sense of how this worked, so in the top line is a study sample where you've genotyped, you have a genotype AG, genotype AC, genotype AA for that individual. And below are the reference haplotypes from the HapMap sample. Um, and, and what you can see is there's much, much more dense data here. If you look at how these, these haplotypes from the HapMap sample line up, you'll see that the um, haplotype in purple um, lines up to the, the, the sample genotype on top. And the bottom one looks like it's a composite 
of the bottom green haplotype and the yellow haplotype shown here. So you can use the data from phased, uh, phased reference samples to essentially impute all of the data um, that you're missing, or at least most of it. So the advantages of this, of course, are that it allows testing of untyped variation. Um, it allows easy combination of data across genotyping platforms. And it's interesting, in our type 2 diabetes study, when we first combined data with the Wellcome Trust and the, the Diabetes Genetic Initiative, we didn't have imputed data. So we took and we lined up SNPs based on R squared, and we, we tried to put that together because there were only about 40,000 SNPs that overlapped between the Illumina platforms that we had used and the AFI matrix platforms that the other two groups had used. Um, by the time we, uh, we published, we had imputed data so that we could, we could um, match up to the, uh, to the Broad and the Wellcome Trust data. And now we're going ahead um, with, with matching up of data based on imputation from, from all of the groups. And it's going to be very interesting to see. I still don't know how many more signals we'll find based on um, completely imputed data. And I think that's one of the interesting questions that are going to come out of this. Uh, the imputation um, provides, as I said, complete data for analysis, um, especially if you're using multiple SNPs. Uh, this is important. And the imputation, depending on the, the product, can increase your coverage. Um, for example, with the Illumina 300K, we increased our coverage of the, the kind of common variation in the genome. If you use a, an R squared or a correlation uh, of about 0.8, we increased it from 71% to 89%. So there was a substantial increase in the coverage of the genome using imputation. Okay. Imputation um, uh, does come with, with, with some, you have to take some care in using this data. It's not a complete solution. So one, it requires large-scale computing resources. Um, you need to carefully assess the quality of the imputation by comparing imputed genotypes to actually genotyped SNPs. Um, the error rates are higher than for genotyped SNPs. Um, it works, unfortunately, and, and not unsurprisingly, uh, less well for rarer alleles, so it's not going to be the way that you're going to be able to um, um, get information, reliable information on, on alleles with frequencies less than 1 percent. Um, and when you do the analysis, the results that you get out from the imputation um, are essentially a, a fractional distribution, kind of the, the probability of each genotype. So if you impute a genotype with, let's say, 100 percent probability that it's AA, you could use that genotype just like you would any other genotype. But if you impute genotypes and you have a 10 percent probability that's an AA and a 90 percent probability that's an AG, you need to take that uncertainty into account in your analysis, which means that you're going to need ways to take into account fractional genotype counts. Uh, there are a couple programs that are available. A recently published paper, um, Impute, by Jonathan Marcini, and a program called uh, Mach 1. Um, developed by Gonzalo Abacasis. So the, in the last things that you need to think about are storing and viewing and merging results are not trivial with this much data. Um, we've developed a system where we use an SQL database. Um, I know there are capacities in Plink, though I haven't used it. Um, it's also very important to test the speed of specialized analysis in differentials st in different statistical packages. We went in to do some of our standard analysis, not, not quite thinking about this, and, and calculated out the amount of time it would take, and it was days or sometimes months to do it in SAS or to do it um, in R. So you, you really need to think about this ahead of time because it's, it's quite staggering. And this may, if you have specialized analysis, means you need to start thinking now about if you need software um, developed to really do that analysis effectively. So in summary, there are lots of things that you need to think about um, before you get the data. Uh, how am I going to store, select, and write out the genotype data? Um, what what uh, quality control and analysis programs am I going to use? How am I going to store the data? Um, do I have adequate computing resources to do intensive computing um, if you decide to do a large-scale analysis outside of the, the set uh, programs um, that have been uh, optimized to do this? 
And then I think I can't emphasize enough that, that testing beforehand um, of either standardized or specialized processes with large-scale data sets. And, and the fun of all this is, of course, is that you get to, you get to work with um, great people and you get to find genes. Thank you very much.